3. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. I often went fishing up in Maine during the summer. Personally, I am very fond of strawberries and cream. But I have found that for some strange reason, fish prefer worms. So when I went fishing, I didn't think about what I wanted. I thought about what they wanted. I didn't bait the hook with strawberries and cream. Rather, I dangled a worm or a grasshopper in front of the fish and said, Wouldn't you like to have that? Why not use the same common sense when fishing for people? That is what Lloyd George, Great Britain's Prime Minister during World War I, did. When someone asked him how he managed to stay in power after the other wartime leaders, Wilson, Orlando, and Clemens Hall, had been forgotten, he replied that if his staying on top might be attributed to any one thing, it would be to his having learned that it was necessary to bait the hook to suit the fish. Why talk about what we want? That is childish, absurd. Of course, you are interested in what you want. You are eternally interested in it. But no one else is. The rest of us are just like you. We are interested in what we want. So the only way on earth to influence other people is to talk about what they want and show them how to get it. Remember that tomorrow, when you are trying to get somebody to do something, if, for example, you don't want your children to smoke, don't preach at them and don't talk about what you want, but show them that cigarettes may keep them from making the basketball team or winning the 100-yard dash. This is a good thing to remember, regardless of whether you are dealing with children or calves or chimpanzees. For example, one day Ralph Waldo Emerson and his son tried to get a calf into the barn, but they made the common mistake of thinking only of what they wanted. Emerson pushed and his son pulled, but the calf was doing just what they were doing. He was thinking only of what he wanted, so he stiffened his legs and stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The Irish housemaid saw their predicament. She couldn't write essays and books. but. On this occasion, at least, she had more horse sense, or calf sense, than Emerson had. She thought of what the calf wanted. So, she put her maternal finger in the calf's mouth, and let the calf suck her finger as she gently led him into the barn. Every act you have ever performed since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. How about the time you gave a large contribution to the Red Cross? Yes, that is no exception to the rule. You gave the Red Cross the donation because you wanted to lend a helping hand. You wanted to do a beautiful, unselfish, divine act. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If you hadn't wanted that feeling more than you wanted your money, you would not have made the contribution. Of course, you might have made the contribution because you were ashamed to refuse or because a customer asked you to do it. But one thing is certain. You made the contribution because you wanted something. Harry A. Overstreet, in his illuminating book, Influencing Human Behavior, said, Action springs out of what we fundamentally desire, and the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, in politics is. First, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Andrew Carnegie, the poverty-stricken Scotch lad who had started to work at two cents an hour and finally gave away $365 million, learned early in life that the only way to influence people is to talk in terms of what the other person wants. He attended school only four years, yet he learned how to handle people. To illustrate, his sister-in-law was worried sick over her two boys. They were at Yale, and they were so busy with their own affairs that they neglected to write home and paid no attention whatever to their mother's frantic letters. Then Carnegie offered to wager a hundred dollars that he could get an answer by return mail without even asking for it. Someone called his bet. So he wrote his nephews a chatty letter, mentioning casually in a postscript that he was sending each one a $5 bill. 
He neglected, however, to enclose the money. Back came replies by return mail, thanking dear Uncle Andrew for his kind note, and you can finish the sentence yourself. Another example of persuading comes from Stan Novak in Cleveland, Ohio, a participant in our course. Stan came home from work one evening to find his youngest son, Tim, kicking and screaming on the living room floor. He was to start kindergarten the next day and was protesting that he would have not go. Stan's normal reaction would have been to banish the child to his room and tell him he'd just better make up his mind to go. He had no choice. But tonight, recognizing that this would not really help Tim start kindergarten in the best frame of mind, Stan sat down and thought, If I were Tim, why would I be excited about going to kindergarten? He and his wife made a list of all the fun things Tim would do, such as finger painting, singing songs, making new friends. Then they put them into action. We all started finger painting on the kitchen table. My wife, Lil, my other son, Bob, and myself, all having fun. Soon, Tim was peeping around the corner. Next, he was begging to participate. Oh, no. You have to go to kindergarten first to learn how to finger paint. With all the enthusiasm I could muster, I went through the list, talking in terms he could understand, telling him all the fun he would have in kindergarten. The next morning, I thought I was the first one up. I went downstairs and found Tim sitting sound asleep in the living room chair. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm waiting to go to kindergarten. I don't want to be late. The enthusiasm of our entire family had aroused in Tim an eager want that no amount of discussion or threat could have possibly accomplished. Tomorrow you may want to persuade somebody to do something. Before you speak, pause and ask yourself, how can I make this person want to do it? That question will stop us from rushing into a situation heedlessly, with futile chatter about our desires. At one time, I rented the grand ballroom of a certain New York hotel for 20 nights in each season in order to hold a series of lectures. At the beginning of one season, I was suddenly informed that I should have to pay almost three times as much rent as formerly. This news reached me after the tickets had been printed and distributed and all announcements had been made. Naturally, I didn't want to pay the increase. But what was the use of talking to the hotel about what I wanted? They were interested only in what they wanted. So a couple of days later, I went to see the manager. I was a bit shocked when I got your letter, I said. But I don't blame you at all. If I had been in your position, I should probably have written a similar letter myself. Your duty as the manager of the hotel is to make all the profit possible. If you don't do that, you will be fired and you ought to be fired. Now, let's take a piece of paper and write down the advantages and the disadvantages that will accrue to you if you insist on this increase in rent. Then I took a letterhead and ran a line through the center and headed one column advantages and the other column disadvantages. I wrote down under the head advantages these words, ballroom free. Then I went on to say, you will have the advantage of having the ballroom free to rent for dances and conventions. That is a big advantage, for affairs like that will pay you much more than you can get for a series of lectures. If I tie your ballroom up for 20 nights during the course of the season, it is sure to mean a loss of some very profitable business to you. Now, let's consider the disadvantages. First, instead of increasing your income from me, you are going to decrease it. In fact, you are going to wipe it out because I cannot pay the rent you are asking. I shall be forced to hold these lectures at some other place. There's another disadvantage to you also. These lectures attract crowds of educated and cultured people to your hotel. That is good advertising for you, isn't it? In fact, if you spent $5,000 advertising in the newspapers, you couldn't bring as many people to look at your hotel as I can bring by these lectures. That is worth a lot to a hotel, isn't it? As I talked, I wrote these two disadvantages under the proper heading and handed the sheet of paper to the managers, saying, 
I wish you would carefully consider both the advantages and disadvantages that are going to accrue to you, and then give me your final decision. I received a letter the next day, informing me that my rent would be increased by 50% instead of 300%. Mind you, I got this reduction without saying a word about what I wanted. I talked all the time about what the other person wanted and how he could get it. Suppose I had done the human, natural thing. Suppose I had stormed into his office and said, What do you mean by raising my rent 300% when you know the tickets have been printed and the announcements made? 300%! Ridiculous! Absurd! I won't pay it! What would have happened then? An argument would have begun to steam and boil and sputter, and you know how arguments end. Even if I had convinced him that he was wrong, his pride would have made it difficult for him to back down and give in. Here is one of the best bits of advice ever given about the fine art of human relationships. If there is any one secret of success, said Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so good, I want to repeat it. If there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so simple, so obvious, that anyone ought to see the truth of it at a glance. Yet 90% of the people on this earth ignore it 90% of the time. An example? Look at the letters that come across your desk tomorrow morning, and you will find that most of them violate this important canon of common sense. Here is a letter written by the superintendent of a large freight terminal to a student of this course, Edward Vermelin. What effect did this letter have on the man to whom it was addressed? Read it, and then I'll tell you. Gentlemen, the operations at our outbound rail receiving station are handicapped because a material percentage of the total business is delivered us in the late afternoon. This condition results in congestion, overtime on the part of our forces, delays to trucks, and in some cases delays to freight. On November 10th, we received from your company a lot of 510 pieces, which reached here at 4.20 p.m. We solicit your cooperation toward overcoming the undesirable effects arising from the late receipt of freight. We may ask that, on days on which you ship the volume which was received on the above date, effort be made either to get the truck here earlier or to deliver us part of the freight during the morning. The advantage that would accrue to you under such an arrangement would be that of more expeditious discharge of your trucks and the assurance that your business would go forward on the date of its receipt. Very truly yours, J.B. Supt. After reading this letter, Mr. Vermelin, sales manager for A. Zarega's Sons, Incorporated, sent it to me with the following comment. This letter had the reverse effect from that which was intended. The letter begins by describing the terminal's difficulties, in which we are not interested, generally speaking. Our cooperation is then requested without any thought as to whether it would inconvenience us and then, finally, in the last paragraph, the fact is mentioned that if we do cooperate it will mean more expeditious discharge of our trucks with the assurance that our freight will go forward on the date of its receipt. In other words, that in which we are most interested is mentioned last and the whole effect is one of raising a spirit of antagonism rather than of cooperation. Let's see if we can't rewrite and improve this letter. Let's not waste any time talking about our problems. As Henry Ford admonishes, let's get the other person's point of view and see things from his or her angle, as well as from our own. Here is one way of revising the letter. It may not be the best way, but isn't it an improvement? Dear Mr. Vermillon, your company has been one of our good customers for 14 years. Naturally, we are very grateful for your patronage and are eager to give you the speedy, efficient service you deserve. However, we regret to say that it isn't possible for us to do that when your trucks bring us a large shipment late in the afternoon, as did on November 10th. Why? Because many other customers make late afternoon deliveries also. 
Naturally, that causes congestion. That means your trucks are held up unavoidably at the pier, and sometimes even your freight is delayed. That's bad, but it can be avoided. If you make your deliveries on the pier in the morning when possible, your trucks will be able to keep moving. Your freight will get immediate attention, and our workers will get home early at night to enjoy a dinner of the delicious macaroni and noodles that you manufacture. Regardless of when your shipments arrive, we shall always cheerfully do all in our power to serve you promptly. You are busy. Please don't trouble to answer this note. Yours truly, J. B. Sumpt. Barbara Anderson, who worked in a bank in New York, desired to move to Phoenix, Arizona, because of the health of her son. Using the principles she had learned in our course, she wrote the following letter to twelve banks in Phoenix. Dear sir, my ten years of bank experience should be of interest to a rapidly growing bank like yours. In various capacities in bank operations with the Bankers Trust Company in New York, leading to my present assignment as branch manager, I have acquired skills in all phases of banking, including depositor relations, credits, loans, and administration. I will be relocating to Phoenix in May, and I am sure I can contribute to your growth and profit. I will be in Phoenix the week of April 3rd, and would appreciate the opportunity to show you how I can help your bank meet its goals. Sincerely, Barbara L. Anderson. Do you think Mrs. Anderson received any response from that letter? Eleven of the twelve banks invited her to be interviewed, and she had a choice of which banks offer to accept. Why? Mrs. Anderson did not state what she wanted, but wrote in the letter. How she could help them, and focused on their wants, not her own. Thousands of salespeople are pounding the pavements today, tired, discouraged, and underpaid. Why? Because they are always thinking only of what they want. They don't realize that neither you nor I want to buy anything. If we did, we would go out and buy it. But both of us are eternally interested in solving our problems. And if salespeople can show us how their services or merchandise will help us solve our problems, they won't need to sell us. We'll buy, and customers like to feel that they are buying, not being sold. Yet many salespeople spend a lifetime in selling without seeing things from the customer's angle. For example, for many years I lived in Forest Hills, a little community of private homes in the center of Greater New York. One day, as I was rushing to the station, I chanced to meet a real estate operator who had bought and sold property in that area for many years. He knew Forest Hills well, so I hurriedly asked him whether or not my stucco house was built with metal lath or hollow tile. He said he didn't know and told me what I already knew: that I could find out by calling the Forest Hills Garden Association. The following morning, I received a letter from him. Did he give me the information I wanted? He could have gotten it in sixty seconds by a telephone call, but he didn't. He told me again that I could get it by telephoning, and then asked me to let him handle my insurance. He was not interested in helping me; he was interested only in helping himself. J. Howard Lucas of Birmingham, Alabama, tells how two salespeople from the same company handled the same type of situation. He reported. Several years ago, I was on the management team of a small company. Headquartered near us was the district office of a large insurance company. Their agents were assigned territories, and our company was assigned to two agents, whom I shall refer to as Carl and John. One morning, Carl dropped by our office, and casually mentioned that his company had just introduced a new life insurance policy for executives, and thought we might be interested later on. And he would get back to us when he had more information on it. The same day, John saw us on the sidewalk while returning from a coffee break, and he shouted, "Hey, Luke, hold up! I have some great news for you, fellows." He hurried over and very excitedly told us about an executive life insurance policy his company had introduced that very day. It was the same policy that Carl had casually mentioned. He wanted us to have one of the first issued. He gave us a few important facts about the coverage and ended saying, "The policy is so new. I'm going to have someone from the home office come out tomorrow and explain it. Now, in the meantime, 
Let's get the applications signed and on the way so he can have more information to work with. His enthusiasm aroused in us an eager want for this policy, even though we still did not have the details. When they were made available to us, they confirmed John's initial understanding of the policy, and he not only sold each of us a policy, but later doubled our coverage. Carl could have had those sales, but he made no effort to arouse in us any desire for the policies. The world is full of people who are grabbing and self-seeking, so the rare individual who unselfishly tries to serve others has an enormous advantage. He has little competition. Owen D. Young, a noted lawyer and one of America's great business leaders, once said, People who can put themselves in the place of other people who can understand the workings of their minds need never worry about what the future has in store for them. If out of reading this book, you get just one thing, an increased tendency to think always in terms of other people's point of view and see things from their angle. If you get that one thing out of this book, it may easily prove to be one of the building blocks of your career. Looking at the other person's point of view and arousing in him an eager want for something is not to be construed as manipulating that person so that he will do something that is only for your benefit and his detriment. Each party should gain from the negotiation. In the letters to Mr. Vermillion, both the sender and the receiver of the correspondence gained by implementing what was suggested. Both the bank and Mrs. Anderson won by her letter in that the bank obtained a valuable employee, and Mrs. Anderson a suitable job. And in the example of John's sale of insurance to Mr. Lucas, both gained through this transaction. Another example in which everybody gains through this principle of arousing an eager want comes from Michael E. Whitten of Warwick, Rhode Island, who was a territory salesman for the Shell Oil Company. Mike wanted to become the number one salesperson in his district, but one service station was holding him back. It was run by an older man who could not be motivated to clean up his station. It was in such poor shape that sales were declining significantly. This manager would not listen to any of Mike's pleas to upgrade the station. After many exhortations and heart-to-heart -heart talks, all of which had no impact, Mike decided to invite the manager to visit the newest Shell station in his territory. The manager was so impressed by the facilities at the new station that when Mike visited him the next time, his station was cleaned up and had recorded a sales increase. This enabled Mike to reach the number one spot in his district. All his tackling, all his talking and discussion hadn't helped, but by arousing an eager want in the manager, by showing him the modern station, he had accomplished his goal, and both the manager and Mike benefited. Most people go through college and learn to read Virgil and master the mysteries of calculus without ever discovering how their own minds function. For instance, I once gave a course in effective speaking for the young college graduates who were entering the employ of the Carrier Corporation, the large air conditioner manufacturer. One of the participants wanted to persuade the others to play basketball in their free time, and this is about what he said. I want you to come out and play basketball. I like to play basketball, but the last few times I've been to the gymnasium, there haven't been enough people to get up a game. Two or three of us got to throwing the ball around the other night, and I got a black eye. I wish all of you would come down tomorrow night. I want to play basketball. Did he talk about anything you want? You don't want to go to a gymnasium that no one else goes to, do you? You don't care about what he wants. You don't want to get a black eye. Could he have shown you how to get the things you want by using the gymnasium? Surely. More pep. Keener edge to the appetite. Clearer brain. Fun. Games. Basketball. To repeat Professor Overstreet's wise advice, first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. One of the students in the author's training course was worried about his little boy. The child was underweight and refused to eat properly. His parents used the usual method. They scolded and nagged. Mother wants you to eat this and that. Father wants you to grow up to be a big man. Did the boy pay any attention to these pleas? 
just about as much as you pay to one fleck of sand on a sandy beach. No one with a trace of horse sense would expect a child three years old to react to the viewpoint of a father thirty years old. Yet that was precisely what that father had expected. It was absurd. He finally saw that. So he said to himself, What does the boy want? How can I tie up what I want to what he wants? It was easy for the father when he was starting thinking about it. His boy had a tricycle that he loved to ride up and down the sidewalk in front of the house in Brooklyn. A few doors down the street lived a bully, a bigger boy who would pull the little boy off his tricycle and ride it himself. Naturally, the little boy would run screaming to his mother, and she would have to come out and take the bully off the tricycle and put her little boy on again. This happened almost every day. What did the little boy want? It didn't take a Sherlock Holmes to answer that one. His pride, his anger, his desire for a feeling of importance, all the strongest emotions in his makeup, goaded him to get revenge, to smash the bully in the nose. And when his father explained that the boy would be able to wallop the daylights out of the bigger kids someday if he would only eat the things his mother wanted him to eat, when his father promised him that, there was no longer any problem of dietetics. The boy would have eaten spinach, sauerkraut, salt, mackerel, anything in order to be big enough to whip the bully who had humiliated him so often. After solving that problem, the parents tackled another. The little boy had the unholy habit of wetting his bed. He slept with his grandmother. In the morning, his grandmother would wake up and feel the sheet and say, Look, Johnny, what you did again last night. He would say, No, I didn't do it. You did it. Scolding, spanking, shaming him, reiterating that the parents didn't want him to do it. None of these things kept the bed dry. So the parents asked, How can we make this boy want to stop wetting his bed? What were his wants? First, he wanted to wear pajamas like Daddy instead of wearing nightgown like Grandmother. Grandmother was getting fed up with his nocturnal iniquities, so she gladly offered to buy him a pair of pajamas if he would reform. Second, he wanted a bed of his own. Grandma didn't object. His mother took him to a department store in Brooklyn, winked at the sales girl, and said, Here is a little gentleman who would like to do some shopping. The sales girl made him feel important by saying, Young man, what can I show you? He stood a couple of inches taller and said, I want to buy a bed for myself. When he was shown the one his mother wanted him to buy, she winked at the sales girl, and the boy was persuaded to buy it. The bed was delivered the next day, and that night, when father came home, the little boy ran to the door, shouting, Daddy, Daddy, come upstairs and see my bed that I bought. The father, looking at the bed, obeyed Charles Schwab's injunction. He was hearty in his approbation and lavish in his praise. You are not going to wet this bed, are you? The father said. Oh, no, no. I am not going to wet this bed. The boy kept his promise, for his pride was involved. That was his bed. He and he alone had bought it. And he was wearing pajamas now, like a little man. He wanted to act like a man, and he did. Another father, K.T. Dutchman, a telephone engineer, a student of this course, couldn't get his three-year-old daughter to eat breakfast food. The usual scolding, pleading, coaxing methods had all ended in futility. So the parents asked themselves, How can we make her want to do it? The little girl loved to imitate her mother, to feel big and grown up, so in one morning they put her on a chair and let her make the breakfast food. At just the psychological moment, father drifted into the kitchen while she was stirring the cereal, and she said, Oh, look, Daddy, I am making the cereal this morning. She ate two helpings of the cereal without any coaxing, because she was interested in it. She had achieved a feeling of importance. She had found in making the cereal an avenue of self-expression. William Winter once remarked, that self-expression is the dominant necessity of human nature. Why can't we adapt the same psychology to business dealings? When we have a brilliant idea, instead of making others think it is ours, why not let them cook and stir the idea themselves? They will then regard it as their own. 
they will like it and maybe eat a couple of helpings of it. Remember, first arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way.